From the headquarters of TELUS, your English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, and I am Sweeney Gray. Thousands of Brazilians are heading to the capital, Brasilia, for the Free Lula March. It is the final destination of the march, which has walked across the country for several weeks. Thousands of campesinos and social movements are coming together to push for the former president, Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva, to be named as a candidate in the presidential election in October. The seven pro-Lula activists are on their 15th day of a hunger strike designed to pressure the government into releasing the former Brazilian president. Religious leaders held a ceremony with them to show solidarity for their political struggle. Religious leaders and social movements organized a religious ceremony in front of Brazilian Supreme Court Judge Edson Fachin. This event was also meant to show solidarity and support to the seven hunger strikers that are calling for the release of Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva. We want to show our solidarity with the hunger strikers. We are with them in their fight against Lula's unfair imprisonment. This is all part of a process to take away our sovereignty and our natural resources. We are going to defend democracy. Lula da Silva still has two more courts to appeal, to strike hopes to urge the Brazilian court to reconsider detention until all appeals have been exhausted. This is a hunger strike for justice, for a more fair country, for equal rights. Religion should be for this, for life. Meanwhile, 5,000 campesinos marched towards Brasilia to support Lula in his quest to register for elections this Wednesday. A representation of the Lula Livre National March also attended this ceremony to show their solidarity and commitment with the strikers' fight. We want to bring our energies from Mother Earth, the energies from the universe, to bless our striker comrades. They are resistance heroes, and we need resistance to build a project for the people. Jeje, Zonalia, Jaime, Frei Sergio, Rafael, Vilmar and Leonardo the seven hunger strikers say they are fighting to recover democracy lost after Michel Tama took office in 2016. We're not asking for much. We just want to have the right to vote for Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva this upcoming October 7th and to join him from January 2019 in his fight for the workers. And our Andre Vieira has more from Brasilia. Greetings to our viewers from Telesur. We are still here marching with the crowds on the streets of Brazil. They are divided into two groups. The one on my left is the Ligas Campesinas, or the Farmers League, which is a group of militants from the northeast region. And on my right side is the column of Teresa de Bengala, or Teresa of Bengala, which are the militants of the north and central east region of the country. We will continue to cover this march and bring you the details. And the Brazilian Supreme Electoral Court has appointed a new president, which could potentially jeopardize Lula's presidential candidacy. Our correspondent in Sao Paulo, Mia Alberti, has more. Well, today the Supreme Electoral Court here in Brazil is electing a new president, and it's going to be Rosa Weber. And she is very well known for following the rules very strictly. Um, in, when she was in the Supreme Court, she voted against the habeas corpus for former President Lula da Silva. So her election as the president of the, the Electoral Court might not be very good news for Lula da Silva also because she has defended the Fischer Limpa law, which says that if you have been condemned on a second instance, you cannot run for presidency. She has defended that law several times before. So uh, tomorrow we are going to see the parties uh, registering their candidates, including the Workers' Party registering Lula da Silva. Um, and after that, she will be the one to decide if the parties can or cannot run. Now, I've talked to a lawyer who told me that why uh, she would not be very good news for Lula da Silva. What's probably going to happen is that the Electoral Court is going to reject Lula's application because of the Ficha Limpa law, and his lawyers will most likely appeal to the Supreme Federal Court. They'll try, but I think their chances are very dim. 
So let's look at what happens after tomorrow, after the parties register their candidates. The public ministry will have five days to denounce the candidate that they think it's not eligible, which is the most likely scenario for Lula da Silva, the former president of Brazil, which is still in jail. So if that happens, then the Workers' Party in Lula will then have seven days to appeal on that decision, and so on and so on. And they are expected to appeal on all of these decisions always on the deadline, because what they are trying to do is to extend Lula da Silva's uh, status as the candidate. And if they can do that until September 17, they will manage to get Lula some airspace on TV for campaign with his face on as the candidate. And also, it will be Lula da Silva's um, face and name on the ballot, which is very important for the Workers' Party and for Lula's supporters, even though Fernando Haddad, the former mayor of Sao Paulo, would be the true candidate. Thanks, Mia, for that report. Two senior military personnel have been arrested in Venezuela over the August 4th attempted assassination of President Nicolas Maduro. The Bolivarian National Guard General Alejandro Perez Gámez and Colonel Pedro Zambrano Hernández remain in detention because of their alleged links to the drone attack against the Venezuelan president on August 4th. With these two new arrests, there are now 14 people who have been held for their alleged role in the attack. And the Venezuelan president has announced a new system of wages and prices rooted in the petro cryptocurrency. Maduro said August 20th will become a bank holiday in order to ease the transition to the new currency known as the sovereign Bolivar. He also changed the rules on fuel subsidies. Lower domestic gas prices will only be available to those who register their cars with the vehicle census. The government will continue to provide direct subsidies to people with a state-issued card. The government said his the president said his government is working on the economic prosperity plan. The president made these changes during a televised address where he also thanked the people in the streets for their support. I want to thank the Venezuelan people for their solidarity and support after the attack we suffered. I admire how much love and solidarity has been spread, how we have all come together, civilians and the military, to defend Venezuela against these criminals that are already detained. The former president of Uruguay, Jose Pepe Mujica, announced his resignation as a senator due to his advanced age and exhaustion. Mojica has published a statement announcing his resignation. He says he will not be retiring from his political activities and he will not be running for another presidential term. Chilean President Sebastián Piñera accepted the resignation of his culture minister. This follows his controversial remarks about the museum commemorating the victims of Augusto Pinochet's dictatorship. Culture Minister Mauricio Rojas had to resign just five days after he took office, the local press released a statement Rojas wrote three years ago where he said that the Museum of Memory and Human Rights that pays tribute to the 3,200 victims of the dictatorship is staging. The inauguration ceremony for President-elect Mario Abdo Benitez has already been met with protests. The inauguration will take place on Wednesday at the Palacio de Lopez in the capital of Asuncion. Roughly 5,000 people and seven, seven foreign heads of state are expected to be in attendance. Protesters say the police have been trying to crack down on their marches. Abdo Benitez won Paraguay's April 22nd elections, but there were allegations of fraud and irregular vote counting. And the Bolivian president, Evo Morales, has announced a meeting with private businesses, business owners to discuss new strategies to improve the nation's economic and financial system. He was given an exclusive interview to Bolivia TV. We need to boost our economy with good salaries and more benefits for workers. It will reform our domestic labor market. We held several meetings with the private sector. They were surprised by our new economic strategies. I'm not an economist. My plan consists of increasing labor force to improve the economy. But when I explain this new method, they agree with me. We're going to have more meetings to discuss these subjects. We're going to take a short break now, but join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting.
Welcome back. Welcome back. In Ecuador, a bus crash killing 24 tourists, most of them Colombians and Venezuelans. The bus crashed 30 kilometers from the capital, Quito, in a road section called the Curve of Death near the tourist town of Papayata. At least another 20 passengers were injured in the attack after the bus crashed. The cause of the accident is still unknown. There have been three bus accidents in Ecuador in the last 48 hours. And some Mexicans are opposing the construction of a new international airport in the capital. They believe the contracts do not take environmental con concerns into consideration and that they only benefit the interests of the companies. Millions of tenzotl stones have been extracted from the Tezuka Hill, 50 kilometers away from the construction site of the new international airport in Mexico City. The excavation has put at risk the life of the neighbors living close by. Their homes were there before any mining project was started. The hole affects approximately 14 hectares and has almost 80 meters of depth. The neighbors are concerned about the cracks on the hill and their homes. Their properties and the construction site are only separated by a fence that was built by the company in charge of the new airport. A contract allows them to extract as much material as needed to build the airport's runway. For us, these fences represent as sentences and show us that they don't care, that they will excavate as much as they want. They are not regulated by the authorities. Non-governmental organizations have denounced the lack of transparency regarding concessions made to contracts for the project. The government of Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador has committed to review the contracts. It's expected he will do the same in the oil sector too. First, we have to analyze what are we gaining with this project, the amount of money invested. The company says it's millions of dollars in investment, but what has arrived isn't what we were expecting. We will review the contracts with responsibility. 105 contracts for hydrocarbon exploration were signed during the administration of President Enrique Pene Nieto as a result of the energy reform pushed by the outgoing government. Analysts have said these contracts were signed to benefit the big oil companies. This is something we have never seen before. This shows us that the government of Enrique Peña Nieto gave everything to the private and foreign companies, leaving the lands in a very vulnerable state. Most of the contracts were protected from any modifications that would affect the interests of the oil companies. Now they're even leading projects in the Gulf of Mexico and are also allegedly starting new projects by using fracking. Teachers in Panama are asking the government to pay salaries which have been delayed and to increase investment in the education sector. And they're considering calling for a national strike to put pressure on the authorities. Teachers have protested outside the Ministry of Education building in the outskirts of Panama City asking to be paid. The Education Ministry has a debt with us, the teachers, regarding our monthly payments. There are a lot of teachers that haven't been paid for five or six months. We believe this is an inhuman gesture and a violation to the labor rights and laws of the country. They are also asking that the investment in the education sector reaches 6% of the gross domestic product. Currently, it doesn't exceed 4%. They haven't fulfilled their commitment with national education for many years now. Teacher unions have been insisting in the necessity to invest what is necessary so that education in Panama improves and becomes what we have. Teachers and authorities agreed on their back pay and education investment after the last strike in 2016, but their requirements haven't been met until now. Teachers' unions are considering going on strike again. We think the government will not fulfill the agreements that we achieved before. That is the payment of the salary debt and the investment of 6% in education. We are criticized when we strike, but this is something we achieved in 2016. Teachers in the country have said they will continue to strike if the authorities don't comply with the agreements made in 2016. Unions are also considering calling for a national strike. After almost three months of political turmoil, the Nicaraguan Institute of Tourism is launching a new campaign to encourage tourists to return to the country.
Nicaragua as beautiful as ever, is the new campaign that intends to symbolize and highlight the best of the nation, its people, its hospitality, its natural wealth, as well as to seek the reposition of the country's tourism sector. Over the next six months, there are plans for recreational and cultural activities. We will be launching this campaign, Nicaragua as beautiful as ever, to encourage and restore that right to healthy recreation and enjoyment of art and culture, to consolidate peace in our country. We will also be doing a series of public and private missions in different markets at regional and international level to let them know what we have to offer. More than 200 people participated in the launch, which will have five phases. Among them are the relaunch of each one of the most attracted tourist destinations between August 21 and September 3. I have been working on four proposals for agrotourism, and we were waiting for an initiative like this one that is happening right now. This gives us hope and we feel that we can regain our identity that was being taken away from us. We are now hopeful and happy. Idalia show off the typical sweets that she makes. It has been her source of income for years. The sales dropped, but now she trusts that it will recover. In economic terms, the losses in tourism during the nearly three months of crisis are around 270 million of dollars. I think it's very good. It's good because we are already selling more products and people come from all over to buy from us. In the coming months, Nicaragua will be promoted in 11 international tourism fairs. Antigua and Barbuda has launched an educational campaign ahead of the November 18th referendum. The vote will determine whether the Caribbean Court of Justice will become the country's final court of appeal. The Attorney General says the country cannot truly be independent unless it is in control of all three branches of government. As one of the last vestiges of colonialism. As a post option thing. It is an Antiguan and Barbudan thing. It is apolitical. No parties involved in the matter. It's what is good for us as Antiguans and Barbudans. And I'm asking, I know we met this morning with, with the committee. The committee is broad-based all across the board. We had the Observer, we had, we had ZDK, we had ABS, and we have point of M radio stations. That is the approach we're taking. We are going on a campaign to make certain that Antiguans and Barbudans are educated about the CCJ. Time now for another short break, but join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting.
Welcome back. The man arrested in connection with the car accident outside the Houses of Parliament in London was not known to the security service MI5. The identity of the man is still unknown and the accident is being treated as a suspected act of terrorism. Earlier, the authorities said that he was being uncooperative. The suspect is believed to have deliberately driven his car into security barriers at high speed after injuring a number of people. Meanwhile, James Brokenshire, Minister of Communities, Housing and Local Government, has urged people to keep an open mind with regards to the incident. And at least 35 people have been killed in the collapse of a motorway bridge in Genoa, Italy. The collapse during stormy weather today causing vehicles to plunge 19 meters to the ground. The Transport Minister Danilo Toninelli said the incident was an immense tragedy and France has since offered Italy its support. Turkey has been hit with sanctions and the president has ordered retaliatory measures. Here's more on that and other news from around the world. President Tayyip Erdogan has asked Turks to boycott goods from the United States, particularly the iPhone, in retaliation for sanctions imposed on Ankara. However, his demand has divided public opinion with some being for and against the move. The declining relations between the two countries has contributed to the lira being at an all-time low. It's easy to say don't eat a hamburger, don't buy that phone. I have a 16-year-old daughter. Take her iPhone away from her if you can. All these people are supposed to not to buy iPhones now? This can't be. It doesn't make sense for me. For how long this can go on, two days later, they will go and buy iPhones. In any case, half of the lawmakers at Berlin, let's see them give away, return or throw away their iPhones. Even their families have these iPhones. This is not the solution. Thousands of people from women's associations, civil society and liberal parties in Tunisia have thrown their weight behind gender equality reforms proposed by President Beji Kaid Esepsi who has announced a draft legislation for equality in the inheritance law. Previously, his proposals were met with fierce opposition from the imams in the country. Demonstrators in support of the reforms chanted anti-Islamic slogans aimed at the Enada party, a conservative Islamist party led by Rachel Ganouchi. Filipino activists have held a vigil to demand an apology from the Japanese government for the use of comfort women during the occupation in the 1940s. Comfort women is a term used for the enslavement of women in brothels during wartime. Candles and flowers were lit in front of a church in Manila. Lila Pilipina, a network of surviving comfort women, have also demanded that the statue believed to be removed at the request of the Japanese embassy in Manila be re-erected. And finally, a female tango duo is challenging sexism and traditional gender roles. Two women danced together at the Tango World Cup in Argentina's capital, Buenos Aires. They say it's to end prejudice and show that, quote, we all can do what we want to do. Cynthia Tomino and Florencia da Luci Lucio impressed the public with their performance in which no man was needed to dance. Two other female couples and an all-male dance team have participated in this tournament. And we've come to the end of this news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at talisyourtv.net forward slash English. And yes, continue to join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for Talisya English. I'm Sweeney Gray. Thank you for watching.